Vimeo started around the same time as YouTube and was sort of the ad-free version. And there was definitely a period, you know, well before I got there where it's unclear which, you know, which platform might ultimately kind of win very early on. But YouTube was YouTube. It was a behemoth. And social media platforms were really taking off. And it was pretty clear that like Vimeo wasn't going to be a social media platform that was made money on ads. So the question was like, okay, well, then what do I do? On today's show, I am talking with my friend Anjali Sood, who is the newest CEO of Tubi, part of the Tubi Media Group, a division of Fox Corporation. Tubi is the most watched free TV and movie streaming service in the US with the world's largest content library of over 200,000 movies and TV episodes, a growing collection of originals and nearly 250 fast channels. And notably, just before this stint, Anjali led Vimeo to become a public company following a spin-off from Barry Diller's IAC internet conglomerate. Now, you still may think of Vimeo as a smaller competitor to YouTube. And frankly, that was what it was for most of the time. But when Anjali took over as CEO, she put a halt on all of that to reinvent Vimeo as a software company that serves a B2B market. And that market, as we know, is booming. By the time Anjali left Vimeo, it was doing around $400 million in annual recurring revenue. Now, that's a remarkable success story, all because Anjali decided to stop competing with YouTube, Netflix, and other consumer video companies to find a better market and strategy to play in. Now, the question is this. Will she take the same approach in her leadership of Tubi? Where is the white space in what feels like a red ocean with streaming services and a competitive content economy? I asked Anjali about all of that, her rise to leadership, the role of media and culture, and so much more. Anjali Sood, CEO of Tubi. Here we go. daughter of physicians and yet your parents thought that entrepreneurship was the biggest lens of impact and that was how you got introduced to the idea of being an entrepreneur tell us more crucible moments framing of anjali sood oh gosh um well my parents are immigrants from india very much came to the united states to realized their American dream, left all their family and friends, and came here to build a life. And medicine was kind of the vehicle through which they could do that. But from the time I could remember, like being a kid, my dad's passion was entrepreneurship. And even though he's a physician, he also started a business, a plastics recycling plant in Flint, that's still there today. So like, from the time I was a little kid, he just sort of had this kind of philosophy that if you really want to influence people's lives at scale, you do it by providing jobs mm. and a livelihood. And and the context was Flint, Michigan is a sort of auto industry driven town that when the automakers left, it really impacted the the city and and the, the population in a way that even decades since has yeah. still, you know, made an impact. And so I think just growing up against that backdrop, mm-hmm. I did at from a very early age see that that business can have the potential to really impact your community and the people mm-hmm. around you in ways that last a very long time. I think I got the bug pretty early, mostly mostly from my dad. Yeah. So give us a picture of Anjali when she was younger. Was she already <laughs> with the lemonade stand or what are we talking about here? I would say I was both like a super nerdy introvert that who just like read book by myself. And then there was a little bit of that. Uh, I remember when I was in elementary school, like I convinced all my friends that we were going to uh, organize a neighborhood carnival and we sold tickets. There was always a part of me that liked to do things and organize things. But truthfully, I was much more shy and introverted as a kid. Mm. And I think it definitely took me getting older and maturing to even consider the idea that I I couldn't even have, I think at that time, imagined myself in a position of Doing what you know, you're doing influence now. Influence or power. Yeah, like that would have felt very intimidating. So how me. did the shift happen? I mean, take us, you know, <laughs> very quickly and sure. speed us up to investment banking. Yeah. And, and of course, Vimeo is a big chapter. We want to spend some time on that, but yeah. bring us up to speed on how that shift happened. You asked about a crucible moments. Mm. Everyone always has theirs. And for me, it was actually, I left 
Flint. I left the public school system in Flint, Michigan at 14. And I went to a boarding school called Phillips Andover Academy in Massachusetts, which is one of the best educations in the country. I was 14. I was Mm -hmm. away from home. I was very homesick. I struggled a lot um, academically. It was a huge change for me. Really? Yeah. You know, I was like coming from like one of probably the worst public school systems in the country to one of Mm. the best, you know, most rigorous academic environments. And I was away from my family. So it was really hard. And I think even to this day, I still think that year when I was 14 was the hardest year of my life. It gave me confidence to overcome it. And I think it was only sort of during those high school years where I sort of found that confidence in myself Mm -hmm. because I went from feeling like I was failing and and so overwhelmed in that environment to slowly feeling like I could belong to eventually feeling by the time I graduated, like I really belonged and Mm -hmm. could kind of hack it in that kind of competitive, intense environment. So for me, it was great. And I, I do think it gave me a confidence to go for things. And that served me well, because when I was in college, I wanted to be an investment banker. I got rejected from every investment banking job. And I just like, I'd already gone through a period where it felt impossible or felt like there were a lot of no's and mm. I just kept going. And so I feel like that really helped me do that more and more as I kind of progressed in my career. Right. So go back to that time when you were feeling like, gosh, the grades are not there. What was the mindset shift that, look, I can do it too? Honestly, I think a lot of it was just I didn't really feel like I had a choice. And by that, I just mean, of course, I could have just gone back home. But maybe because for me, my parents had like left their family and friends to go pursue that American dream, to give me the opportunity for his education. And I think also because I could see the difference, right? Again, coming from Flint, Michigan Public School to Andover, like the privilege that I had was so, it just was like, you can't squander that. You find Mm -hmm. a way, you just keep going. And I think it was almost just the inability to even consider that you had another option that you just persevere. And then what you usually find is that can get pretty far if you just work really, really hard. (laughs) You know, like all of your doubts about your innate abilities and talents, if you kind of just say, okay, like I'm just going to work harder than everybody else. I'm just going to try harder. Like effort, if you believe effort can make up for a lot, I think that helps often power through. And that's when you then realize you do have innate talent and ability that maybe was hidden or that you didn't appreciate. Yeah. So bring us up to speed in terms of your crucible moments in your career. Being rejected from investment banks, what happens next? Most of my 20s was a fairly kind of random career path. I did end up getting a job at investment banking at a a startup investment bank. And that turned out to be a really great learning experience. And then I actually found my way into media. I was at the old AOL Time Warner. In that job, I was in sort of a corporate M&A role. We're in-house M&A. Sure. And that was probably the first time that I could see the difference between when you are sort of consulting and working on deals versus operating, right? Because like we would work with Warner Brothers and HBO and Time and AOL on deals. And, and I would get to go deep with the teams and then the deal would close and then they'd move to integration and my team would step out and go do something else. Right. And I would find myself being like, I kind of wish I was staying and seeing mm. that through, right? I would get really invested in what that operating company was doing and its success. And that was when I realized, like, I think I'm maybe more of an operator than mm. an investor. I went to business school. I was at Amazon and a bunch of different roles effectively trying to transition from more of a finance role into an operating role, which took me more steps than I thought because it's a different skill set. So that was a lot of my 20s and then ended up at Amazon having a bunch of different jobs, but getting really excited about marketing as a function. I just liked that it was very creative and also analytical. And then that led me to Vimeo. Vimeo was obviously, I think, my my big my big moment, crucible moment in my career. It was over a very short period of three years, kind of went from being very much like a middle manager, functional leader to the CEO. Yeah. So, and how that happened was exactly this phrase that I remember you saying on another interview, where if you can merge your personal goals and the business goals as one and the same the better that would be for you. And that's what you did by basically filling a gap. Tell us more about that. If I were to sum it up, I think, because people do often ask me like, how the heck does a 33-year-old with no CEO experience Mm -hmm. end up in that seat? Like anything, 
so much is serendipity, but, but so much of it is also decisions that you make along the way. And I think in Vimeo's case, it was like we were in an industry that was going through a lot of change and that forced the business to be in a period of really needing to think of its new strategy for the future. And there were some gaps. I just sort of got excited and passionate about one potential strategy and became a little bit of like the de facto champion. And I think probably the biggest thing was I just was willing to bet. I was willing to bet on myself and on the idea. And there were so many other people around me who obviously believed in the same idea and supported it. But I think that that one of the differences is like having the conviction that you're going to bet on something. Because if the person, you know, the investor behind that, you're not going to bet on a 33-year-old if, she, if she's hedging. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If she's not willing to bet her career on an idea, you're not going to give that person a chance. And so I think there was definitely, that was part of it. And then to your point, I mean this sincerely, like it never occurred to me in a million years up until literally the minute that I was offered the CEO role that was in my path, not once. The entire time I was working, it was because I really believed in the idea. I do think when you put the business first, it unlocks so much career opportunity. And I always say, like, you can spend so much energy and time. We all are ambitious. We absolutely should be. Ambition is good especially when it's channeled towards what is best for the business. I always give this advice to, to younger people who are ambitious in their careers, which is like, take all of that ambition. Don't bottle it up, like use it. But the more you can use it to actually put the business first, I do think like there isn't a leader or investor on the planet that doesn't want to lean in when they see somebody doing it. Of course, Vimeo has done a massive pivot under your leadership and now has, of course, been listed. Tell us a little bit more about what that shift was from what we all knew to be an ad-free version of YouTube <laughs> yeah, yeah. to basically a B2B SaaS model. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that thinking and basically that idea that was your conviction. Yeah, look, I think Vimeo started around the same time as YouTube and was sort of the ad-free version. And there was definitely a period, you know, well before I got there where it's unclear which, you know, which platform might ultimately kind of win. And at the end of the day, when you're totally free for viewers, you can scale in a very different way than when you're paid. And because Vimeo was ad-free, mm -hmm. the platform couldn't monetize with ads. So you had to charge the creators. And so Vimeo sort of stumbled on a SaaS model very early on, but it put the, the platform in a different trajectory. And so when I took over, it was really just to double down on that and to say, like, by that point, it was like, YouTube was YouTube. It was a right. behemoth. And social media platforms were really taking off. And it was pretty clear that, like, Vimeo wasn't going to be a social media platform that was made money on ads. So the question was like, okay, well, then what do we do? And we toyed with everything. I started to see organically in the data and in talking to customers, more and more businesses were starting to embrace video. And this seems obvious today. Yeah. yeah. That was not obvious at the time. We thought we were inventing the future when we would say things like, one day everyone's going to live stream a town hall and distributed teams are going to like tune in instead of attending in person. Like that was not a thing. And most investors were very skeptical. So I think it was really more about just like see, you, you know, seeing the signs, seeing the signals organically of what's already happening in a platform, connecting that to maybe what's happening in a market. And that's sort of what led to the transition. And then in my sort of six plus years as CEO, it was very much about executing that transition and doing it in a way that would help us scale. When I left, we were about 400 million of, of ARR, but but also be a sustainable, efficient, and enduring business that mm -hmm. would be around and self-funding for years to come. And that's probably the thing I'm most proud of. Going public was amazing and then hard when the yeah. stock price was coming down. Like, And I learned a lot. What I feel like the impact I could make the most on the business was just putting it in a position where it's profitable today, no debt, plenty of cash on the balance sheet, significant recurring high margin revenue, right. predictable, and in a market that Vimeo can continue to invest and innovate and bring video tools to the world. And so I think for me, like probably what I've learned is sometimes the things that you think are the markers of success mm -hmm. over time, over sustained periods of time, you realize it's it's usually those much more fundamental things. Yeah. So getting to that point of a strong business case for 
this strategy when you know it, it sounds like and, and you use the word battle tested <laughs> sounds like of course the journey to get to that point was definitely not easy what was the most challenging part in making that pivot bringing people along and sticking to it so it worked Vimeo before it went public was owned by IAC which is Barry Diller's internet conglomerate and I think they were really always willing to take calculated bets. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that was really smart is for a year before I became CEO and we switched to the business model, we actually ran almost two parallel strategies. And I was the GM of a, of a small business unit within Vimeo that was basically running the strategy. Sure. So the benefit is we did have a year to kind of see some signals, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we launched a product for businesses. We started to see some traction, see the market develop. And that helps give a little bit more conviction. The hardest thing about that transition sh probably should have been bringing people along managing change. There's always skeptics. Yeah. Businesses don't have linear lines of success. You have a lot of like failure moments. And interestingly, Sarah, like none of those were the challenges for me. I mm. was so fortunate. I had a team around me at Vimeo from the day I stepped into the role. They championed me. They championed the strategy. We had each other's backs. And so when things were hard and there were skeptics and it wasn't working, we just never flinched, mm. truthfully. Now, looking back, I realize that was that's actually probably quite rare. I think you can do amazing things when you have that kind of environment. So I was really fortunate. I think the hardest thing was just you don't have great signals, right? Like I'll give you an example. One of the first things that we did when I became CEO is we acquired a company called Livestream that was at the time the number one kind of player that did things like Livestream town halls. And this was pre-pandemic. And so we had this thesis and I remember like we completely bombed the mm -hmm. launch of live streaming on Vimeo under me. It was one of the first things that happened when it, as CEO. We missed all of our numbers Thanks. on live streaming. We were so wrong. Like we thought people would live stream in business context and it just wasn't happening. And we would go to companies and be like, don't you want to do this? And they'd be like, yeah, like maybe in 10 years. And we were just like, we got this. I just got it wrong. All the signals got it wrong. And then of course the pandemic happened and everything changed overnight and it became a wild, wild success. That powers actually a lot of the video you see in most companies today. So I think that's the hard part. It's, mm. it's that like, you have to trust your instincts, but you also have to be flexible based on the signals. And sometimes signals don't manifest in months or quarters. It takes years. Right. And it's just having that ability to kind of know when to stay the course and, and when not to. What made you sort of decide then to go for talking about funding and bringing yeah. in more cash on the books? You decided to go to the IPO route, right? Yeah. Which I know you've spoken of as just a net. It's not really a mark of success. It is a way to get funding, right? Talk to yeah. us a little bit more about that decision, that executive decision making for which path to take. Yeah. Well, first I should say in Vimeo's case, we went public through a spin out, mm -hmm. which is more like a direct listing in that we actually didn't raise capital. Here's what I would say I've learned from the experience, which is like, I don't think going public, I know we romanticize it. I did. And yeah. it's an amazing experience and feeling I will treasure for my whole life. But then you wake up the next day and you're like, okay, same business, same challenges, same Tons of reporting. Yeah. Like it doesn't change the fundamental task at hand. And so I think what I have observed many friends who who also took companies public during this time. It's a fundraising vehicle. It's a liquidity opportunity for your investors. Yep. I think it can be an incredible, it's a way to force a business to get really disciplined and rigorous, mm -hmm. right? Because to be able to do the quarterly earnings and to be able to kind of you have to operate at a certain level of rigor, which I do think is can be healthy for a business. But I'll be honest, I think a lot of companies probably go public too early. Mm. They're too small and they're too, they're too early. But I would say, like, if you don't think of it as a goal in and of itself, and you think of all the alternative ways you can access capital or get liquidity, there are many more options. And I, you just have to be really ready for it because there are trade-offs. I think the biggest trade-off is just it's much harder to be long-term oriented in your thinking. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how supportive your board is. We're humans. And when you have a whole – think of it as, like, you need – we all want feedback. And when you're private – your feedback comes in the form of quarterly numbers and a board meeting and a fundraise. And when you're public, your feedback comes every second from a stock that mm -hmm. moves every second. And even if you have the blinders on and you stay focused, does your exec team stay focused? Do your employees stay focused? Do your shareholders stay focused? It's a wonderful environment 
for businesses that have reached a certain maturity and size is, is my general perspective, but I don't think it's for every business. And, and what, I don't think it should be a mark of success. Yeah. And what does that mean? Like maturity? At what point, you know, that's a subjective across I, verticals, across different types of businesses. I would say the things that I appreciate now, it's mm-hmm. really predictability and visibility. At the end of the day, like you're as a public company, you need to be able to manage expectations appropriately with your shareholders. And that's that's a huge part of your job. And I think for a lot of businesses that went public during a pre or, or immediately post pandemic period, it was very hard to parse what was pandemic versus not. And it was very hard to, basically, you can't tell if you were lucky or you were right. You just don't know. And you're a little bit of both, but you can't really tell. It doesn't matter what size of revenue you are. Right. But I do think you want to be confident in the predictability of your revenue growth, meaning you know that if you invest this, you put this into the machine, you're generally going to deliver this. And you you know that there's going to be ups and downs and variability, but it's within a, a, a range and you have enough kind of ability to see that. To me, that is the optimal place to be, to be a public company. And what were some of you, I guess, as you're thinking about what you had to do to get to that place? I know you had employee layoffs, you had to do some really hard cuts to get the numbers to where it should be. Many CEOs today are thinking about it in a very different environment, but they've also, for some of them, they're pushed for liquidity, frankly, as I know from the investors, thinking even about secondary options and things like that right now. For the CEO who's going through this time of getting ready to be listed or for an exit event, what would you say were some of your mistakes and your advice to them? It, It honestly does still go back to me about predictability of revenue. The chairman of Vimeo, uh, he got me a mug. He got me and the team a mug. This was like years ago from a public. And it, this, we, we were being pushed to be profitable and we had to do hard things. Yeah. But it was a mug that said, revenue cures all. I have that mug still. It sticks with me because at the end of the day, the way to profitability, to sustainable profitability, is a never cost cutting. Mm-hmm. It's growing efficiently. That's right. what it is, right? Yeah. And so that is, like, that's the thing. You just, what you want to do is you want to know I know how my investments, whether it's in people or marketing or product, I generally know that they will have an impact. Sometimes you don't have that luxury. Sometimes you're in a market that is moving and changing or you're taking a big swing and your investors are locking arms with you and all of those things. But then you should understand and you should prepare culturally your team that you're taking a swing. You don't know if the ROI will be there. And if it doesn't materialize, you will have to adjust. What I think many of us learned in this period was you can do one or the other, but you can't do both. You can't take huge swings and but set a culture where everybody thinks it will know 100% work and always go up. That's what made it hard for a lot of folks because again, it was was so much was pandemic driven. We thought we were making more reliable bets than what we were. And that is the part that I know for me I, was a lesson that I ha- yeah. hard learned lesson, but one that I'll never make again. Yeah. You pointed out something that I think is really crucial in that in the world of technology, change is the only constant, right? So signals change. The cost of marketing and growth today, performance marketing, talk about, you know, meta and all that is getting increasingly more expensive. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, some of the growth strategies that worked for you in Vimeo with all this in consideration. It's going to sound probably very, very obvious, but product-driven organic growth Mm -hmm. all day long. If I could go back, I would say if you have a great product that is in the right market, that is mission critical, that actually helps customers find a way to take that customer happiness and satisfaction and turn it into word of mouth and make it organic and let like find a way for your product to be your marketing yeah. and that will that will feed you forever and ever and ever and you can always supplement with other things mm-hmm. but you never want to be in a place where you're relying on things like paid marketing as against that other piece that's when things really hummed on our PL and in our business it's when we had that And when I think there were things that required us to adjust, it's when we started to lose sight of that. And it's so easy, you know, it's so easy. And especially, I think, if you're a venture-backed startup, especially if you were in in the world where you were raising times when expectations get really high and then you've got the money, 
So you've got the money, Spend expectations it. are high, yeah. and here you go, put it all in digital advertising, and you just have to be really, really careful. And I, mm. it's funny, I sat in so many meetings where you know you talk about like LTV to CAC and LTV to CAC, but the reality is you you can like define LTV to CAC 100 different ways. You have to actually be committed and intellectually honest about is this really organic, like sustainable, enduring growth? And that I think the yeah. that for me is one of the biggest lessons. I'll and hear. so your virality was very much, would you say, word of mouth when people really love the product. You talk about Dropbox, right? Yeah. Every business is different. In Vimeo's yeah. case, I think the virality opportunity, I think some of which we realize, some of which ha has yet to be realized, is just that every time somebody watches a video in our world, it, in the business context, you're often sharing content yeah. or you're engaging, chatting and engaging. And that's basically a viral loop. Yeah. Because every time you share a video with 10 other people, you're basically exposing them to, in Vimeo's case, our video player mm -hmm. for the first time. And so we kind of really tried to think about how to bottoms up drive adoption from employees and organizations through that. In the video, like enterprise SaaS world, I think the companies that have managed to get that motion right are the ones that are succeeding. Disproportionately. So how many years do you spend in Vimeo in total? I was in finish? Vimeo for nine years. Nine years. Yeah. Close to a decade. Close to a decade. Yes. And then you decided to then make a big shift in your life. Yeah. To, to be. Yeah. How did that come to be, <laughs> that decision and, you know, going uh, deep into a yeah. different world? Connected, but different. It surprised me. It's so funny because nine years is a long time. Yeah. Six as CEO when you're not the founders. Some might say too long in tech. And yet I was never, I was just so all in on the job. And it was so consuming, so yeah. consuming. To be sort of hit my radar and I did get really excited about it. Part of the reason is I'd spent nine years on the creator side of video and trying to democratize professional quality video by making it easy for anyone to create content. I had been attracted to Vimeo in the first place was because it was an industry going through disruption and Vimeo had a totally different business model. I'm looking at Tubi and I'm like, wait, and I was looking at the same exact themes on the audience side. Mm -hmm. You know, right now media is going through significant disruption. You have big tech entering and really kind of in many ways becoming the new platforms for entertainment. And you have a traditional sort of media and Hollywood ecosystem that has to adapt. And I was really intrigued by the fact that Tubi was in many ways trying to democratize video storytelling for audiences with a 100% free platform. So when everybody else has subscription fees to consume movies and TV series, Tubi is 100% free. And we're now the number one free TV and movie streaming service in the U.S. I was just attracted to the idea of like market and disruption, business that's doing something different that for me really aligns with what I think of sort of going where the future is going. And those are my kinds of opportunities where I can be better sort of at my best. It's when it's in those types of markets, when it's more on the strategy and sort of evolution side. So I think I just was like, you know, I, I reached the point where I was like, I'm getting a lot of energy about this thing. And I was looking around. I stopped feeling like I was the only person who could lead Vimeo, which, by the way, is a ridiculous thing to think because obviously many people can lead Vimeo. But when I was in it for yeah. so long, I really felt like I was needed. Mm. And as we scaled and after we went public, you bring in the right executive team, you scale the right processes. And like I said, we, we got to profitability. We would gotten to a place where I really felt like this company will be around for decades to come. And I just kind of felt like, okay, it's it's my time. And right. uh, it's probably Vimeo also should have fresh leadership. So tell us a little bit about the future of media, the future of content. Yeah. And now your lens of being there for what, eight months? Yes. What are we up against? I mean, this is this feels like a red ocean yet again. I think more broadly, I think there's going to be a lot of change in media. I think there's going to be structural change. I think there'll be consolidation. I think there will be hard kind of adjustments. But I also think it's really exciting and there's so much room for innovation and forward thinking. And my general perspective is if you think about entertainment, mm -hmm. our job is to entertain. We almost do ourselves a disservice when we think of things like television, streaming, social media, gaming. We're all in the attention business. Yeah. And what's happening is the younger generation is forcing us to break these walls because the younger generation is going to say, okay, I, maybe I'll go to the movies and pay, you know, for a movie ticket, 
or maybe I'll subscribe to Netflix, or maybe I'll just go on TikTok. And so I think what we're seeing is a real, and there's, it's been happening for some time, but I think you, you've got YouTube and Amazon in particular sort of entering the more traditional sort of media world, and it is forcing a true convergence between Silicon Valley and Hollywood. I'm coming from the world of short form video at Vimeo, mm -hmm. and this is obviously more long form movies, TV. And I, I'm really interested in like, what is that going to look like for younger generations? Because they want to watch TV series and movies, mm -hmm. but they're not going to pay a bunch of money to have six different streaming services in the future. And the kinds of stories they want to hear, see told, the kinds of creators yeah. and storytellers behind that the formats, the platforms, they're evolving. And so that's where Tubi is looking to play. We see ourselves as free entertainment for the cordless generation. And we're sort of designing our content, our brand, our product to really serve that group. And I'm super excited and energized about the future of entertainment because in, even just from what I see from the team, there's tons of room to mm. build better experiences and, and tell more stories and just evolve with what our audiences are demanding of us. So when you think of yourself, going back to your point about being product-led, now taking that product-led mindset into 2B, what does that look like? I mean, ad-free is no longer a theme these days on even Amazon Prime, which is paid, and you have tons of ads. Everyone is annoyed by that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and yet you're taking that model, essentially. How are you captivating your audience? And yeah. what does that look like? What ages are you targeting? Like, yeah. What's the strategy here? So we are definitely targeting more Gen Z audiences. Mm -hmm. And just more broadly, I think younger, more diverse, even more female forward audiences. And that's because those are the audiences, one of the future. That's, yeah. you know, but also, and those are the audiences advertisers care about reaching and can't reach often. But it's also the audience that we think has more unique needs and, and tastes and think about willingness to pay and willingness to watch ads differently. I'll give you the, the big distinction between like Tubi and Amazon is Amazon, you're paying for Prime Video and you're watching it. So to be clear, you are paying to watch ads. In Tubi's case, it's free. You never, ever pay anything. And so what we're finding is that younger people they do care about that. That lack of friction mm -hmm. is important to them. They're totally fine watching ads if the content speaks to them, if it reflects culture, mm -hmm. if it tells the kind of stories that they think speak to them. Our formula is very much like free and frictionless and then content that you can't find anywhere else. And some of it is nostalgia and like mm -hmm. fandom based. We have like horror and thriller. We have a lot of like random, we call rabbit holes yeah. that you wouldn't ever expect. Just like what YouTube did with the short form with their long tail. Yeah. It's a little bit of that. It's like just recognizing we have a multidimensional taste and people want to binge and they want to go down their rabbit holes. When you go to TikTok, it resonates is because it's basically, it tells you what's relevant, what's happening in culture. Mm -hmm. There is a long form version of that. There is a way for the next breed of originals or TV series and movies to just really reflect that audience, their lived experience, their vibes, their culture. I think that's what we're trying to figure out how to do. It's interesting that you talk about we're all sort of competing for attention, right? Yeah. And as you know more than most, you know, although Gen Z, our generation, millennials and beyond are thinking that a lot of the older generation think that the younger generation are short on attention. We're the generation that are binging. <laughs> series, you know, <laughs> hour-long series. So in total, you're watching a six-hour movie. Yeah. So that <laughs> speaks to quality that you're talking about, yeah. content that speaks to them that's culturally relevant. What will we see when you say culturally relevant? Yeah. Give us an example of something you can speak about today. I'll give you some examples. You know, we, even just in the last month, some of the original content that launched on Tubi, a show called Borders, which is about five inner-city Black kids who Got our, I get scholarships to go to boarding school, mm -hmm. a very preppy boarding school, and kind of become the poster children for, for diversity and, and what is their actual experience and struggles. That's an example. Yeah. Another series that we just premiered, I think it was last week, is called Big Mood. It stars Nicola Coughlin, the, the Bridgerton star. A little bit of a younger flea bag, but it's about the friendship of two young women, and covers the themes of mental health. These are the types of examples yeah. where it's it's the stories, 
It's the lived realities that are reflected. It's the cast. Mm -hmm. All of those decisions, I think you'd make them differently through the lens of what does the younger audience want? And what I have learned in the last eight months is the sort of traditional Hollywood ecosystem is still very much prestige oriented. It's oriented towards content that will resonate in award season. And it's it's a little bit different from what I think a lot of younger audiences want to watch. And that, I think, is the opportunity for Tubi. So question to you. This is something that Netflix has been criticized about, right? And sort of leading the woke generation and deciding <laughs> for culture, because the reality yeah. is media informs culture. It does, You yeah. know, vice yeah. versa. Totally. As the CEO yeah. of a company that is focused on being culturally relevant, influencing in the future, how do you think about that? It's it's a great question because something we actually talked about a lot internally. I'm very intentional and choiceful about the words reflecting culture versus amplifying or defining culture. I don't think Tubi's job is to do the latter. And so what we see ourselves as is more of a mirror. We want to listen to our viewers. We have over 75 million monthly active viewers, Mm -hmm. and we have tons of scale between viewership and content. We have the world's largest library of movies and TV series, multiples more than because of that long tail. So we have an opportunity to listen and understand what are the themes? What are the stories? What are the fandoms? What are the communities? What do they care about? We have an opportunity to better reflect that in our choices Mm -hmm. around content. And so I don't think we should be the arbiters. TikTok can do that. TikTok chooses to the algorithm chooses to you know, promote something, then so many people see it. I think for us, we actually like the diversity of viewing and viewership on Tubi. We celebrate that. And we use ML and personalization so that each person can go down their own rabbit, rabbit hole. Holes. And and that's, by the way, and that model is what is has led Tubi thus far to grow. Actually, one of the fastest growing streamers and continues to kind of move up in viewership rankings because I think it's working. Well, a lot more rabbit holes that we could go (laughs) to, but we are short on time. So (sighs) I'm going to shift very quickly with one last question and then to do a rapid fire. Okay. So one last question. Of course, I have to bring this up because I'm here because of Time 100 and I tune into Uh. Eric Schmidt's concerns about the use of AI in AI-generated content. And of course, we can't leave here without talking about AI today. That would be weird. That would be weird. It is 2024. It is 2024. So... Quick thoughts here on where this will take content. Of course, it can be scary and we need like some serious regulation. However, I am in the activist camp for one very specific reason. I spent a decade at Vimeo trying to make it easier for people to create and produce content. The amount of time and people who built tools to make it easier. And the fact that you now through generative AI can take an idea that's in your head and type it and very soon you can see it as a video asset yeah. is dramatically accelerates creativity. That is my belief. Mm-hmm. We have to do that responsibly because there are many pitfalls to AI. But the potential to accelerate creativity so that every single one of us can be a creator, for me, that was the dream. I think about what's possible right now and how it felt impossible five years ago. It's really remarkable, I think quite exciting. How do you think very quickly it will impact the way you are running your business? For Tubi, I think, you know, I think over time you will see more great stories being told. We're, we're lowering the, the barriers, right? Sure. Because before, for you to even like today, you read a script and then you, you green light the, and then you have to do the, and then it's so many steps. It's so expensive and time consuming. And I think there is an opportunity over time. I think it's going to take time on mm-hmm. like sort of more professional quality storytelling. But for shorter form content, if you're a marketer, I think if you're a marketer right now, like think about your ability to create an ad. It's just amazing. And you don't have to work with super expensive agency and spend millions of dollars to have something good and to have your idea show up in an actual tangible thing. I just think that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Billion dollar questions. Are you ready for the These rapid are billion fire? dollar questions. Billion dollar questions. <laughs> okay. All right. We got to start with an easy one. Quick hack, a habit that changed your life for good significantly. I try and get nine hours of sleep a night. Mm. Sleep is my hack. I have lots of small other things, but like literally nothing matters more. Who is the most famous person you ever met? And did they live up to your expectations? I've actually met a decent number of yeah. famous people. I'm not going to do the celebrity thing. Um, I've met 
Bill Clinton and George W. So presidents on both sides of the aisle. And oh, here's what I thought was really interesting. I was really surprised at how much more warm and human a president can be. And, I, and I've learned that it's very hard for that to translate on a debate or a yeah. TV you know, screen, the, the warmth and humanity. And I suspect that probably most politicians have more of that than we all realize. Mm. So they did live up. They did live up to yeah, your I mean, I, I, I was very, yes, I, I think I was sufficiently charmed in every interaction, which is probably not surprising for someone to become president. Where do you feel most at home or at peace? In my old New York City apartment <laughs> with my two boys. I have a little robe. I have my coffee. Uh, and we sit in the mornings and it is my it is my happy time and anything is possible. Mm. What's a contrarian view you hold? I don't know if it's contrarian, but it's something I say a lot. I tend to believe that both can be true. So I'm more of an and thinker than an or thinker, mm -hmm. meaning this happens to me all the time at work where, you know, it's like, well, we can do this or that, or, you know, this thing is happening, therefore this must be true. And I tend to think that actually many, many times it's not an or, it's an and. And I really force myself to think that way because sometimes it's not possible to defy gravity, but many times that's when you stumble upon creative solutions. So a lot of times people are like, no, but this is a trade-off. And I'm like, but is it? Is it a trade-off? And that tends to Give be Give me my... a specific view that may be out of this world. I'm kind of skeptical about dentistry. Oh. <laughs> is it real? I've Do never we need that publicly. I'm now, I'm like, really, oh. I'm like concerned about what, what repercussions what this is going to have with my dentist, yeah. which is not the intention. <laughs> But I'm like always like, really? Like, is this necessary? Like, sometimes I'm like, mm, I'm not sure. Mm, I love it. Love it. Okay. <laughs> what do you know for sure, though? I, what do I know for sure? Mm. No one ever builds anything of value on their own. It's a team effort. What will your legacy be? I hope that through the work on the businesses that I've been part of, that it sounds super cheesy, but like, I do hope that through video and, and through stories, the world can be a more connected place and we can be a more empathetic and human group of global citizens. You know, I'm going to ask this question because of the work that I do. What needs to change for women to really lead forward and to get the investment that they deserve? So many things, but I'll give sort of maybe a, an angle that I, two angles I think I, I, my thinking has evolved a little bit on this. One is I've always thought women need to support each other more and embrace a community and lift each other up because I think men do that. But I also think we need more proactive support from men. It's an and, an and instead yeah. of an or. And I, I think that that is really important. If I look back at the people that made bets on me that changed my life and my career is women as much as men. And so that's, that's kind of one angle. Um, the other one is one that I, from a personal perspective, have gotten more interested in, which is, I think for younger girls, Gen Z and, and, and younger girls who are going to be entering the workforce, I think confidence is going to be an area that we need to do a better job on. Because I think younger girls today, like imagine growing up in social media, yeah. it's a different environment. And I always think back to like that initial, like my 14 year old self and what mm -hmm. gaining confidence enabled me to do now. And I just worry about how are we going to offset the intense kind of insecurities that can come from some of, some of the other things happening in the world around us. So I would love to, I'd love to try to help figure that out over time. Mm. Advice, mantra, one-liner to the next generation of funders and builders tuning in. I'll share the advice from my time at IAC that I still find so true, which is patience on vision, impatience on execution. That is my advice. Love it. And you mentioned your two young boys that we've seen a lot of. What would you want to tell them today as they're tuning into this years later and growing up? Oh, so cheesy, which is just believe in yourself. Anything mm -hmm. is possible. I genuinely pinch myself every day and can't believe what the world has given me. I, I want my boys and, and anyone who's, who's young and ambitious and excited to believe. You got to believe. And Anjali, we believe in you and thank you for believing in yourself because all world has benefited from your leadership. Oh, that is way too kind. All right. Well, high five on making your yeah, million dollar moves. <laughs> all right. It's a wrap. And we did it. 419. Wow. Okay. You nailed it. Amazing. Right. You're so good. You're such thank a pro. You. Oh, my God. Thank you.
And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chen Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings and you've been listening to Bill and Dollar Moves. <laughs>